So welcome everyone. I'm Brianne Cassetta. I am a park ranger here at Frederick Law Olmsted National Historic Site. As I am talking to you from my office, I just realized I should have probably sat in like a more historic part of the house <laughs> than this one. So it's a very boring background, but that's okay. Um, we're really excited to have you all here for our first virtual event. Um, this is the first time we're trying this, so thank you all for joining in with us. Um, unfortunately, this season and this year has been very crazy for a whole bunch of reasons. Um, so our intention was to celebrate the 150th birthday of Frederick Law Olmsted Jr. this summer. July 24th, 2020 was the sesquicentennial of his birthday. Um, and so we were really hoping to talk a little bit about Junior and um, what he learned from his father and really tonight, obviously focus on their work in California. Before I introduce the panelists, I want to go over the format um, and a little bit of logistics. So as you can see, you can see us, we can't see you. Um, so we appreciate the chat, but if you have a direct question for the panelists, I'll be monitoring the Q&A button right next to chat. Um, so if you can log that, like click on that, um, then I will be able to see those and pass those along to our moderator and panelists. Um, if you want to use the chat for comments or conversation among the audience, please feel free to continue to do that. Um, we will be filming, we will be hitting record on this program. Um, again, that will just be for us and we are not planning on publishing any of the comments um, or any of the questions and who they're from just as the recording of the panelists themselves. Um, so thank you all for spending your Sunday evening with us. Um, really appreciate your time and I just wanna thank some people involved in this. My colleague, Lisa Shatterjan, um, who you all got received emails from, could not have done this without her and so I wanna say a special thank you to her. Um, I'd also like to thank uh, Friends of Fairstead, who are our partners in this, and we really appreciate their um, partnership and their effort in getting us live coming to you from Brookline. <laughs> um, so thank you all um, for that as well. So I hope you enjoyed watching episode one of California Forever, and with us to discuss the legacy of the Olmsteads in California are Alan Banks. Hi, Alan. Hi. Hello, everybody. <laughs> Sally Kaplan. Sally, uh, Lord Meyer, and David Vassar. Hey, hey. I'm going to introduce them to you and then we'll get started. So Lauren Meyer is a landscape architect with a specialty in historic preservation and has worked both in public and private practice, helping to preserve many of the nation's most important cultural landscapes, including the restoration of the Fairstead landscape right here where I am tonight. Lauren has published many articles on landscape preservation practice and is a co-author of the historic resource study, the Olmsteads and the National Park Service. She is an editor of the master list of design projects of the Olmsted firm and of the papers of Frederick Law Olmsted. David Vassar is an Oscar nominated and Emmy award winning filmmaker who has enjoyed decades of experience as a successful writer, director and producer that has taken him to some of the world's most magnificent places where he has created unforgettable films. His inspiration remains the same, to produce films that strengthen the bond between people and nature. In the 1970s, David began his professional career as a writer and director for the film unit at the Smithsonian Institute, Institution, where he won two Emmys. In 2018, David received the John D. Graff Award from the Wild and Scenic Film Festival, acknowledging a lifelong commitment to producing environmental films. In addition to the programs about the natural world, David has also produced and directed films about the LaGuardia High School for Performing Arts in New York City, the return of Hong Kong to China, and an exploration of the ancient, ancient Maya of Central America for Lost Civilizations, a winner of the National Emmy Award for Best Informational Series. In the 1990s, he was a primary director for the highly rated NBC television, television series, Unsolved Mysteries. In 2001, David launched his production company, Backcountry Pictures, with his producing partner, Sally Kaplan. Discover Hetch Hetchy in 2006 is the award-winning film hosted and narrated by Harrison Ford. Currently, they are producing Exquisite Wasteland, a documentary feature film that provides an unexpected journey through the magnificent deserts of the American Southwest. Sally is an award-winning producer and writer with 20 years of film and television experience. Partnering with David in Backcountry Pictures in 2003, Sally has served as a producer on Discover Hetch Hetchy, Grand Teton River, Video Rivers, Perspectives from the Peaks, Red, White, and Green, and California Forever. Additionally, Sally has worked as a field producer and writer on programs for PBS, Discovery Channel, 
Travel Channel, Animal Planet, and many others. She has served as a guest artist and associate professor of film and video at NYU, UCLA, University of Colorado, Naropa University, and was a fellow at the Colorado Council of um, her screenplay Crossroads was produced through the American Film Institute's highly competitive directing workshop for women. Sally was an executive editor of a nine panel video installation for the acclaimed exhi exhibit on DNA at the Smithsonian Institution. She also served as an associate pro uh, producer on the film celebrating the 50th anniversary of the National Gallery of Art in Washington, DC, directed by the Academy Award winner, Aviva Sleslin, as well as an exhibit film for the Metropolitan Museum of Art on, of Indonesia. Sally currently serves as producer for the desert doc documentary, Exquisite Wasteland. And our moderator tonight is Alan Banks. For close to 30 years, Alan Banks oversaw the historical interpretation of Frederick Law Olmsted National Historic Site in his position as supervisory park ranger. During this time, he de developed a variety of landscape tours and lectures on the Olmsteads and their work, which he presented to groups both locally and nationally. Alan also regularly presented curriculum-based program for local educational institutes, including Harvard University's Graduate School of Design, University of Massachusetts at Boston, and Boston University. Alan served and continues to serve as proof of his participation tonight as a leading Olmsted historian for researchers and staff alike. His passion for Olmsted is rooted in deep historic inquiry and philosophical interpretation. So there's a lot of experience, a lot of diversity, and a lot of love for the topic tonight. Um, throughout this panel. So I'm really excited to get started. So Alan, I'm going to send it off to you. Okay, well, I, I just want to start off. I, I'm sure all of you were drawn here to the Olmsted story from different uh, directions, but I, I thought it would be nice to kind of give a baseline kind of biography of uh, Frederick Law Olmsted Jr. Um, so again, this is a sesquicentennial year. I did say that correctly. Uh, again, on July 24th, 1870, he was born in Staten Island. Uh, so he is a native New Yorker and spent about the first 10 years uh, of his life, uh, again, living on West 46th Street with his father, mother, and brothers and sisters. Uh, eventually, his father, Frederick Olmsted Sr., started doing much more work in the Boston area. And in, in the early 1880s, they moved up to Brookline, Massachusetts, which is just outside of Boston, uh, first renting and eventually buying uh, a small little farmstead at the corner of Warren and Dudley Street. I'm actually sitting in the library of the Olmsted home. Uh, but attached to the home over the years, they created a huge design studio. Um, Fred Jr. Uh, attended Roxbury Latin and then went on to Harvard College at that point in time, the class of 94, which was significant not only for his education, but for the fact that's where he met his future wife, Sarah. Uh, her cousin, Philip, uh, was part of the Harvard Camera Club, and Fred Jr. and he were uh, pretty much big shutterbugs. Um, it was all also during this time uh, at Harvard that he started being uh, tutored on a much more regular basis by his father to someday, you know, carry the mantle of both the name and the firm. Uh, two of the early projects he was involved with, um, again, more as an apprenticeship, was the Chicago World's Fair of 1893, and especially Biltmore Estate in Asheville, North Carolina, uh, which was in Olmsted Sr.'s mind, a place where it would be a training ground for him. Uh, his, when his father retired, eventually he joined with his brother, John Charles, in a partnership, Olmsted Brothers. Um, and it was really under this iteration of the firm that it would reach its peak, uh, especially during the 1920s, when here in Brookline, they employed uh, close to 70 people, all different parts of the design process. Uh, some of the projects he worked on, that's, this is hard. I'm trying to distill 87 years of life and about a 60-year career into just an, a minute or two. Uh, but some of the more well-known projects, Forest Hills in Queens, a, a very uh, suburban community, Palos Verdes, I know somebody's out there from Palos Verdes uh, out in California. Uh, he was involved with designing the park Loop Road, or what they call the Loop Road up in Acadia National Park. So he was involved with a variety of different landscape design projects. But he also became, especially as later in life, but even early on, a much uh, more of an advocate, uh, especially for preservation. Um, one of the, uh, also I should mention early in his career, he was involved with the Macmillan Commission, the Senate Park Commission, which looked at restoring the original L'Enfant design of Washington, D.C. Uh, he was also on the Fine Arts Commission, so I'm just a litany of things. But perhaps most important for my career was that he helped get established a National Park Service and helped draft the legislation, what we call the Organic Act, that established us. 
So kind of Fred Jr. gave us our mission statement to, to conserve the scenery and the historic objects therein and leave them unimpaired for the enjoyment of future generations. So again, early in his career, he starts getting involved uh, as an advocate. Uh, and during the 1920s, he actually ends up traveling, as we're going to hear a lot more about, out to California to create a survey of what places should be set aside, both historic and scenic, for that state. It's considered really a seminal report in terms of state park systems. Um, uh, let's see, where else we have here? I mentioned establishing the National Park Service, role as a consultant. Um, and, oh, I should mention also that uh, he was also involved with the Save the Redswood League, uh, the Sierra Club. And one of his very last um, kind of consultation jobs was on the Yosemite Board of Advisors, which was created again, uh, again to help guide the National Park Service, kind of an outside group to help guide us in the management of that. So uh, if anybody wants to add anything, I, again, I know I must have missed something significant in his life. Um, he did have a daughter, uh, Charlotte. Um, and I'll just say a funny story. And, and again, we're going to talk about California. When she was a teenager, she actually helped drive the car when she was 14 years old all around California as they were doing this road trip to kind of find out what places might be saved. So that's a, a, a little bit of Fred Jr. He died again and uh, actually died in California. Um, so he, and I, this is just my personal thought, I think eventually he considered California to be his home. Um, I think he really fell in love with it. So saying that, I know why I am interested in the Olmstead story and why I stayed here for 30 years, but I would like to hear a little bit about our participants. Uh, uh, Lauren, how did you get involved? Besides just being a landscape architect, which I, I have a feeling that you're, uh, you're a little bit deeper into Olmstead than just that. Well, I, I do have a, a sort of conventional um, uh, introduction to Frederick Olmsted, and it happened, in fact, in, um, when, during my landscape architecture education when I had the uh, great benefit to hear um, Al Fine talk about the role of Frederick Law Olmsted Sr. in shaping American cities. So by the time I received my degree in landscape architecture, I was pretty well indoctrinated into the history and theory and the work of the Olmsteads. And of course, living um, in um, the Boston area, um, we are surrounded by um, the, the great legacy of the Olmsted firms. I, I came to understand after learning about Olmsted that, of, that the hand of the Olmsted firm, um, including the sons and other successors, um, played an important role in many of the great landscapes that have shaped my life. Particularly, uh, I was thinking today about Rancho Santa Ana Botanic Garden um, in Claremont, California, and uh, Sequoia Kings Canyon, places where I spent a lot of time in my undergraduate career learning, um, learning botany and learning about the flora of California. So um, that was really important. I've had the great pleasure and opportunity to, um, to meet and work with Charles Beveridge, editor of the papers of Frederick Law Olmsted. I met him very early on in my uh, career when he was advising the um, California State Park on um, you know municipal park program, um, and and that's been really important in my you know understanding and appreciation of the Olmsted legacy. Okay, so, uh, uh, Sally and David. Obviously, anybody who saw the care and the beauty of your film knows that you had this connection to Frederick Law Olmsted Jr. Was this an epiphany that one of you had, or was it something that you had always had in the back of your mind that someday? Uh, you know, when my project ends, I'm actually going to start this new project. So either one of you can kind of maybe answer that and start. So having worked in Yosemite in my 20s, I certainly knew of Frederick Law Olmsted Sr. and his work as, they called him the first commissioner, but in fact, he was the first superintendent of Yosemite mm -hmm. in, the, in the 1860s. Um, so I knew who he was, but it was uh, when I got engaged with doing the research, when Sally and I got engaged in doing the research on the California State Parks and realized that um, 
Frederick Law Olmsted Jr. actually conducted the survey of what pieces of California would be preserved as state parks. This becomes um, not an extraordinary, not only an extraordinary undertaking, but um, to survey the places and essentially nominate them for protection. Uh, really, uh, I mean, he basically drew the master plan for preserving the most beautiful places in the state from Point Lobos to Calaveras Big Trees to uh, Anza Borrego Desert. So together then, one realizes that the impact that they've had on preserving uh, great public space, particularly Olmsted Jr.'s work up on the North Coast in the Redwoods, um, it's, just, it's just an extraordinary legacy. Unbelievable. And for me, I came to understand the Olmsteads through researching this film. When this film came to us, it was following a number of years, David would say to me, we're also a married couple, by the way, you know, I really want to do a film about the different places of California. He wanted that. When this film came to us from outside, it felt like the perfect fit. I grew up on the East Coast and visiting my family who had moved to the West Coast, I always wondered why is it that so much of the West is so beautiful and so preserved and so much of the East along the coastline is not? Why is it I can drive up Route 1 from the base of California all the way to the top and I can see the ocean? Why is that? And the answer came as I was working on this film. And I got in a heartfelt and a soul felt way, the importance of the two of them. And I became intrigued um, in the making of this film about the connection also between the father and son and how the legacy was passed by family members. It's really moving. And we should, we should conclude by saying we, we, we have developed an hour or a two hour special. Just on. Just on the Olmsted, it's called the Olmsted Legacy. And the film, if, if it's funded and made, would, would cover exactly story. what we've been talking about, the impact of these father and son across two generations on conservation in America. It's an incredible story. Lauren, could you perhaps speak to that, what the connection between Olmsted Sr. and his philosophy and how that was transmitted to his son? What were similarities? What were perhaps some differences in the way they looked at preservation, especially? Well, I think... You know, first and foremost, um, beginning with the, the Elder Olmstead, there was a incredible um, commitment to um, making parks um, accessible and free for all. And that was a fundamental principle. And that second, that um, the provision of parks, whether they be national, state, or, or municipal parks, was a fundamental um, role that government should provide for the people. And that contributed to the health and well-being of all citizens. And so that's a sort of general concept and principle that is absolutely fundamental to um, the Olmsted vision of parks and carried through throughout um, uh, the work of the later um, individuals. It's important to note, as Alan said earlier, there were three Olmsteads, um, John Charles as well, who was Olmsted Sr.'s uh, stepson and the um, uh, half-brother of um, Frederick Law Olmsted Jr. And um, he was an you know, important contributor to the office as well. And with his son, with his, with his brother, Frederick Law Olmsted Jr., they together formed the Olmsted Brothers. Um, one of the things that I found of great interest when we were working on the study about the Olmsteads in the National Park System um, and looking at Frederick Law Olmsted Jr.'s role at Yosemite in particular, so I'm talking about Frederick Law Olmsted Jr. now, um, was the number of times he would wave the Yosemite report at you know various you know administrators and and staff and quote from it in terms of what the national park service should be doing at yosemite so there was no question that he really believed in the fundamental principles of that yosemite report and felt that the national park service should be following those principles in the way um, the park was managed 
Um, obviously, you know, one of the things that I think uh, draw people to parks uh, is that idea of kind of escaping from whatever that need is. And um, could, uh, when you were doing your uh, film, uh, Dave and Sally, uh, when you were trying to get that sense across of the personal connection that people make to their parks, what were some of the challenges of filming the emotion of a person? If, uh, that's the only way I can think of putting it. I think you should talk about landscape as character. Yeah, well, um, David reminds me, something that we try to do in all our films is place landscape as a central character. Um, <laughs> if you can do that in a film, you're giving an audience an experience of a place, even if they don't go there, they can get it by looking at the film. In so doing, they can begin to get the vision from the lens of the character who is human. So what I think we were aiming to do as we do in all our films, and I hope we were successful in doing from the Olmsted father and son perspective, is how passionately moved they were by these places. If we can get you to be passionately moved by the images, you might understand in a deeper way how passionately moved they were. Um, we also like to connect our audience to a place in an emotional way. So um, again, I think the most important thing is to invite audiences to want to go there, but also to know that they have an experience of a place knowing it's there even without going there. Yeah. No. I think I, I think to add to that is is um, just the idea of um, sparking a relationship between the audience and the place, so that if they if if they are uh, if they emotionally connect to the place and take the time to go there, then they're moved a little further down the path towards becoming activists and supporters of conservation. And that's, you know, that's a critical, critical transition. I mean, parks play a huge role in that, but, you know, in order to, to, in order to establish the relationship with the place so that you care about it, you, you got to get out of your car and go there. So that's, that's another piece of, of what we try to do. Does that uh, I mean, that's really the park service. I'm sorry, Sally, go ahead. I just wasn't sure if we answered the question the way it was asked. I think you did, okay. <laughs> but I would, I would, I, <laughs> oh, now I just, um, anyways, uh, uh, Lauren, could, could you speak to me a little bit more about Olmsted's role? Uh, again, we're, I know we're talking about state parks, but I think uh, we also would go for the National Park Service. Uh, he, uh, I think uh, somebody described, maybe been Ethan Carr or, or Ralph Diamant, who, who again were co-authors of your report on the Olmsted and the NPS, uh, he was a hired gun. <laughs> he was somebody who could be who was outside the you know the the bureaucracy, and uh, can you tell me a little bit about that how he felt about his role as that. It's a really interesting. That's an interesting question. Olmsted was involved with the National Park Service, um, really from before the 1916 legislation up until just shortly before his death. It was he was absolutely devoted. Um, and he played a number of different roles. There were some conventional design projects that came into the firm um, that he took on or other members of the, the firm took on. Um, and so those are specific wow. projects. But there's this other role that he played um, called collaborator. And he was sort of a paid consultant slash staff sort of like a staff person without benefits, if you will. <laughs> and he, um, because they had an office in Maryland um, and he was doing a lot of work for the national capital, in the national capital area, um, he had the opportunity to meet very regularly with senior Nat park service officials and with the you know, Secretary of Interior, for example. And he worked on um, collaborated with six different um, National Park Service directors, beginning, of course, with Stephen Mather and continuing on through um, the 1950s in this role as collaborator, 
where he basically was available as a sounding board to help answer, you know, problems and issues that were having that were happening in the parks. Um, one of the most interesting um, things that I found in that role is his work in the um, Colorado River Basin, where he was brought in to basically negotiate between other federal agencies over water rights and um, um, a lot of issues yeah. around um, dams and so forth. So he basically um, advised yeah. the National Park Service on everything from design and road construction to how to train young landscape architects to um, actually conducting um, surveys for potential new parks. Uh, David. Really, uh, really, really quick, Alan, just I wanted to just um, hop in. There's a question from the audience specifically like speaking to some of this National Park Service and the um, preservation and conservation side of it. And um, we have a question of who is who do you think is carrying the mantle of the Olmsted today in terms of conservation of the natural wonders like our national parks? Any thoughts on how that legacy plays out in 2020? Ooh, that's a that's a that's a that's a, nat, that's a question for the National Park Service. Yeah. Yeah. What do you think, Riyad? <laughs> I'm retired, so <laughs> I have I have a few thoughts on that. I, I would say that um, there are a few in the last the last sort of national figure who I felt carried the mantle uh, was probably David Brower uh, in his fight to preserve the uh, the Grand the Grand Canyon, but What's really occurred is that all of these national parks and state parks have these um, uh, nonprofit park partners uh, yeah. like, like Friends of Fairstead or the Yosemite Conservancy or the Grand Canyon Trust. And so it's very, very diversified, um, far more so than it was in, in the Olmstead period. And, and I, I think the last, as I said, I think the last person that I can remember who was a giant uh, was David Brower. And I may be wrong. There may be somebody who's come along since then, but I can't think of who, who that might be. Do you got, David, do you get a sense of the relationship that uh, we, Olmstead Jr. had with the state of California? Or is there any, you know, did they get to see eye to eye on what his mission was? Was there any kind of... Uh... So there was, you know, I don't really know the history. Lauren probably knows it better than I do, but I know that there were some parks that were nominated that were not protected. Um, so I'm sure there was some back, you know, I mean, when you go shopping for the most beautiful places of California and then you present the shopping list to the governor and the, and, and the, and the state park commission, um, there's certainly some horse trading going on, but I don't, I know so, so that. David, um, super, David, super quick. Somebody actually asked if you could speak to a couple of those like key ones that the state of California said no to. Be curious about what didn't make the list. Yeah, I, I, I don't have that information. <laughs> uh, I don't have any of the specifics. I was hoping that Lauren might, but yeah. <laughs> I, I don't really, I don't really, I know that, I know that um, when the Southern California coast between San Diego and say uh, Santa Barbara uh, started being walled off by private owners. In other words, on the west side of the road, uh, if you drive from in Santa Monica from Santa Monica to Malibu, which is about 35 miles, nearly all of the, 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 except for the public beaches that have parking lots, nearly all of the views to the ocean are gone because they're privately, private property. Private property. And that's something that Olmsted really howled about uh, as, as, as in, in that period of 1930s and 40s. So that's one that I can think of that, that was lost. Now, having said that, um, if you look at the state, I, I don't know what, I can't remember specifically what the statistic is, but I think the California coast is roughly 1,250 miles, 1,300 miles, somewhere in there from San Diego to the Oregon border. And I think there's about 600 miles that are preserved as open space um, by state parks, national parks, national forest, and Bureau of Land Management land. So um, that's quite a legacy. I know LA, uh, there was a plan drawn up uh, with a gentleman named Bartholomew and Olmstead. And I, I think there's a great example of something that a lot of it was not executed. 
uh, to the detriment, of course, to LA. Uh, lost a lot of parkland that would have been, you know, integrated into the into the you know growing city. But and obviously, coinc not yeah. Coincidentally, uh, myself and Christopher Tufty, who was the cinematographer for the California Forever, we did sort of a hobby film we shot for three years about the restoration of the LA River called River in Disguise. And that was, I, I don't know, that was like 1983 or 84. And now the restoration of the Los Angeles River is, is actually, I mean, it's gonna take forever, but it's, it's, it's a full blown thing now. Then it was just a crackpot idea. And of course, the, the, the Bartholomew Olmsted plan for the sort of rewilding of Los Angeles the Los Angeles River was the corridor um, that would bring the city together. The way Central Park is. Yeah, exactly. You can actually see a clip from California Forever on the Backcountry Pictures website, backcountrypictures.com. There's a, there's a 10 minute clip from the film. Now, anybody can answer this, but when Olmsted was calling for the preservation of spaces, he wasn't just talking parks in the traditional sense. He was also talking about uh, more cultural landscapes, uh, historic places. Um, so you're starting to see him broaden the idea of preservation. Uh, could somebody speak to that? Anybody speak to that? How that, again, Olmsted Sr. tended to be uh, more towards the conservation of this great scenery uh, but it seems like Olmsted Jr. was starting to like focus on different aspects of landscapes, not just again pretty pretty places. And, I, and I'm I'm not going to call Yosemite a pretty place. But. <laughs> I, I I say a couple of things to that. The first is that I mean, if you read what you know, say Ethan Carr has written about Central Park and Yosemite, he's seeing them very much. It has very similar, in fact, and that is that in Olmsted's eyes, it's 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 about sort of enhancement of natural features and making these places accessible. And so um, the question, is, so at at, at uh, Central Park, of course, you have lots of design, and at Yosemite, you have lots of preservation. But still, Olmsted was thinking about how do I get people from Stockton to Yosemite Valley that's easy, and so in fact, it's open to all, and how do I make a one-way loop road that allows visitors to see the, all this great scenery? So there is a design component to how you make these places um, accessible. So that's a, so it's not just preservation versus design. It's all, it's an integration of both that allows people to experience the, the great places. And the, the second thing I think that is interesting is in the development of the um, Organic Act and mi the mission statement that, um, that Alan referred to, with the National Park Service, you do see the notion of historic you know, historic sites. And that probably follows what happened in 1906 with the Antiquities Act and this real worry, particularly in the Southwest, about the destruction of these sacred spaces. So there was a real concern in the early 20th century about the loss of um, particularly archeological sites. And so that factored into the legislation and then carried through um, in a big way in the development of the California State Park System that, um, you know, David could speak to better than, uh, better than I, but that's just, just, you know, some thoughts about. It was interesting, I did, um, there were some interesting things written by Frederick Law Olmsted Jr. about preservation, his, what we call today historic preservation and he was very concerned um, in the later years about the National Park Service getting, um, you know, being authentic and not sort of creating, you know, <laughs> false histories through, you know, the reconstruction of um, historic um, buildings and such. So that's, that was kind of an interesting aside. It's not terribly developed, but, um, but it is, but I, I did take notice of that. 
What, what about Dave and Sally? I mean, what, what, did, what type of places did uh, he call for and uh, uh, hopefully got preserved that were more of that cultural side? I, and I hate using that term culture because like what yeah. I was saying, yeah. you know, everything, almost everything is a cultural landscape to some extent. I think, I think that the way to think about it is, is there's actually a 75 minute version of the film. Um, uh, but I think the way to think of historic preservation vis-a-vis -vis Olmsted Jr. and the California survey for nominating his historic sites is that what the film tries to do is using, is it tries to chronologically use the historic sites uh, in a way that tells the entire history of California. So if you, if you, if you, if you think about um, the La Parisima mission uh, in, um, on the Central Coast, um, that sort of talks a little bit about the Spanish colony that California was. And if you think about Old Monterey, um, that's where um, Old Monterey is where the Cal California Convention got together and decided upon statehood. And if you think about, uh, if you think about Old Sacramento, you can think about the beginning of the Transcontinental Railroad. And if you think about the half a dozen gold rush parks in the mother load on the western slope of the Sierra where we load, where we live, you can you can touch you can touch um, you can touch the ground where that incredibly historical moment took place. And if you go just literally 20 miles from Sutter's Mill in Coloma, you can go to uh, Chasse, which is a Native American site that preserves the memory of the, of the Miwok. And so in these two parks that are <clears throat> literally a half an hour drive apart, you can see uh, the gold rush change history. I mean, the population of California went from 80,000 to 300,000 in two years. And if you go 20 miles away, you can visit the place where the Miwok lived, which recalls their genocidal uh, destruction which was brought by the 300,000 people from out of state who brought uh, a lot of disease that they had no, um, uh, that they had, that they couldn't resist. So, uh, yeah. Well, just to add something, it's not structures that we're talking about. It's historic places where people interacted with the place. Mm -hmm. So, you know, when you look at a place like Point Lobos, you're just struck by the extraordinary beauty. You think of the plants, you think of the trees, you think of the ocean, you think of the animals. But when we go to some of these other places, you're reminded of the people and who they were then when they were there. So mm -hmm. it kind of brings in people in a very hopefully seamless way in the way we tell the story filmically. And that's, you know, well, that's what I was going to ask you. How, how different was it when you were filming something that was more towards, again, there was a lot of interaction with people as opposed to a place that was much more natural. And again, that's a lo another loaded term. When you were filming it, what were the challenges of, of both? Well, just a, a challenge about filming in a beautiful remote place as a producer is very challenging. Um, <laughs> one of the things is that to work in film, you tread upon a place. You bring people in, you bring crew in. It's not just what you as audience members are seeing in the screen. It's all of us behind the screen. You have to use dollies, you have to use equipment. And it's very hard to be really, really, really careful. But we're trained at this and we do. So one of my challenges literally as a producer was working closely with each superintendent and each of the rangers who were going to be with us mm -hmm. to assure them that we're going to be careful. Mm -hmm. So that was a very logistic challenge. But David, you wanted to speak yeah. to another challenge. Yeah. yeah, I just wanted to say that, you know, so what we, what, what, what our audience here today has seen is episode one. And I think Brianna is going to make arrangements to make episode two available um, by request, or I'll let you talk about that. But, you know, the, the, the importance of historic parks is not just an Anglo-Saxon European idea. Um, and in, in episode two, we talk about two specific, two, two specific places. Um, Angel Island, the Chinese immigration station on Angel Island was, was actually 
a place where incoming Chinese were held and, and often for a year or two and barred entry into the United States. So that is a incredibly contemporary story given everything that's going on with immigration today. And then there's another park in the Central Valley called uh, Colonel Allensworth. And it, that was a, an agricultural community founded by uh, African Americans who came to California from the South immediately after the Civil War and created an agricultural community of two, three, four hundred people uh, in the middle of the Central Valley. So, you know, Juneteenth is Juneteenth celebrated right. there every year. So the whole idea is that if you're going to build support for national parks, you have to build a diverse constituency. You have to create monuments and historic sites that um, a variety of people, a variety of, of Americans who have um, extraordinary experiences that are unique to their culture. But by, by expanding the universe of parks, you are essentially expanding the constituency to support parks into the future. And then just to answer the way the question was framed, a challenge was to find those stories. It was not easy because when I was researching Angel Island, the story that most people wanted me to tell was the military story. Hmm. And it was actually a wonderful um, mentor that we worked with that was one of our advisors named Joseph Enbeck who whispered in my ear, Sally, check out another part of Angel Island that's also a park. And mm -hmm. I did, and that became a major story in our second part. So it was a challenge to find the more untold stories. I think Brienne is- uh... I, have, I just have a question tied off of this, and it's gonna be a super quick answer from everybody. And Alan, you can feel free. But speaking of these untold stories, and whether it be a state or national park, because history is so diverse, we had a question about, um, what has not been designated as a national or state park that you would suggest become a park? I'd be curious to hear from everybody if there's a story that is not yet told or not yet told in full that you would think um, would want to be a park. So super quick responses. Any, I know that's a hard question. <laughs> I always say the same thing I, and, it will, and it will never become Graceland. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, rock I mean, and roll. Story, you know, <laughs> yeah. uh, that, that, no. it's it, it is a, it, so. The one I have in mind is a historic site because uh, it was uh, uh, there are some ex, there are some extraordinary um, ruins and remnants of the Chumash culture on the central coast at Gaviata, uh, which is sort of right where 101 turns inland if you've ever driven out of Santa Barbara, but. Um, they've been, they, there was actually a proposal to create a, a, a Gaviata National Seashore uh, back in the 70s and the private landholders uh, who are essentially residential landholders, there's some, there's, they run some cattle up there too and there's a little bit of agriculture. Not a quick answer, but that piece of land uh, and that coastline is absolutely phenomenal and historically terribly, terribly important and it, and it has been set aside though. Lauren? You know, it's a hard one for me. Um, you know, I, I don't have a single one that comes to mind at the moment. Sally? I was the one that hinted to David to the Gaviota Coast. So. <laughs> <laughs> a twofer. A twofer, yes. That's right. Two, two for water. Yeah. It is, it is a challenging question. We just discussed that not too long ago. Um, Alan, we are coming close to our time, so I know that you have a couple of questions. Yep. Uh, a couple more questions from folks. Yep, so I've got a few I can read. Go first, here. or do you want to take the ones that were written in prior to? I want to because these people got. Um, why don't I read the the first question here, which I think is is a, is a good question. Um, it says, "I thoroughly enjoyed the first episode of California Forever, having personally visited." Uh, sorry, I'm a little bit. Uh, glasses might help. <laughs> <laughs> like Yosemite, Sequoia, and King Canyon National Parks, and the beautiful California coastline of San Francisco, Monterey, and San Luis Obispo. I would love to hear your comments on the irony of Olmsted's vision that parks are for all, not just the wealthy, yet the beauty of San Simeon would not be possible if not for the wealth and private ownership of William Randolph Hearst. I think the castle contributes in a unique way to the beauty of the region. 
So it's basically, you know, what, you know, how the, the dynamic of yeah. private ownership versus public ownership. I have, I have a quick answer to that that I, I think might be relevant. Um, we interviewed, uh, I can't remember his first name, but it was a grandson of Hearst who now lives on the, you know, the, the Hearst family has some John, land John uh, north of the castle where they have their own private homes. And they did an exchange with the California Coastal Commission where they gave up all the land on the west side of, one of, of Highway 1. They exchanged that for the right to build uh, three or four more family houses that you can't see from the highway. And so that's an incredible example of, you know, the, the people of the state of California. I don't know what the mileage is, but I think between the town of San Simeon and I guess Ragged Point, mm -hmm. it's, it's 22 or 23 miles. And, and, and the land that, that was exchanged, I mean, in some places it's only a hundred yards wide, but in other places it's a mile and a half or two miles wide. So that's I a- just, I just want to um, add that as, you know, years later, here we are in the 21st century and a lot of our country is built up. So back to the question earlier, that was who's taking up the mantle for national parks. It's not quite a direct answer to that, but the groups that are really taking up the mantle for how to preserve spaces now are individual land trusts, which mm. are trusts that reach out to private landowners and ask them, would you consider selling this to us so that it does not get developed or so that it gets developed so beautifully as you would want? And so land trusts, in a way, is what's picking up the slack for mm. what the OM says once did because we've lost so much land. On, on the San Simeon question, you know, the one thought that I have is uh, I think that that is viewed as a historic site. So rather than, uh, you know, so, so the concept of parks being accessible to all still applies because it becomes a historic site that is now accessible to all. And second, I would say that, you know, here in the East, we have benefited from the great benevolence of uh, folks like, uh, you know, John D. Rockefeller Jr., who had an incredible role in the um, preservation of uh, Mount Desert Island and Kikadia National Park, and was in fact single-handedly responsible for bringing, you know, Olmsted Jr. to Acadia to advise on um, the construction of the, the motor road, road there and other aspects. So. Um, there's always been a role for um, uh, folks who are able to be the, be the you know, the, the bene to, to create the benefit for others. And, um, you know, that, that's important. It's important that that continue today. Yeah, there's that. There's and that. I, can, I can also, oh, I just yeah, like to add also that one of the partners uh, kind of in some ways, it was the, the, the genesis of a lot of this was Charles Elliott, who was a partner with the Olmstead, helped form the Trustees of Reservations, which was the first public land trust. Um, yeah. And kind of also related to that question, the, the Olmsteads recognized that, you know, there was a, a disconnect. Fred Jr. actually specifically talked about the disconnect between Biltmore Estate in Nashville, North Carolina, being surrounded by the poorest people in our country in Appalachia. But he said it was only the wealthy who could afford to take a place like that and set aside 10,000 acres of land to experiment with forest free. So there was that part of it where the Olmsteads recognized that there was this dichotomy between public and private land, but just because it was private didn't mean it still wouldn't benefit people through the work that they did there. Mm. Yeah. Well, what comes to mind for me and, and Rockefeller is the, is, the, is the land he bought up in Jackson Hole oh, yeah. to preserve the, the yeah. view yeah. of the Tetons. and. Sure. He actually sent, you know, he sent guys in. Nobody knew it was Rockefeller, right? Yeah. He, he totally got together with a small bank in Jackson, Jackson Hole and, <laughs> and surreptitiously bought up all the land because he knew that if, if you lose Jackson Hole, you lose the view to the Grand Tetons. And he, well, and, and of course, he, he had other roles at, at Yellowstone and in the Virgin Islands and 
So that legacy continues. And, you know, and, and the North and the North Coast, the yeah. North Coast Redwood Parks. Yeah. So to diverge a little bit from landscapes, um, there was a quick question about um, health in the Olmstead family. I couldn't hear you. Couldn't hear you. Sorry, there a question about the mental health of the Olmsteads. Um, yeah. Senior suffered from um, some bouts of some bouts of something. So, um, and then there's mention in the film that after Junior surveyed California, that he had to take some time off for exhaustion. And just curiosity if that was something that was related to his father um, and his father's issues, or if it truly was exhaustion from doing all of that work. So, Lauren, thoughts on. Yeah. You know, I, I like to avoid this question. My, my <laughs> on it, my, I have a particular perspective on it, and it, it is this. Um, just imagine for us, in, it's, I think it's really hard for us in the 21st century using Zoom and talking to people all over the world, how difficult it was for someone in the 19th century to travel from coast to coast through the Panama Canal, you know, by boat to get to, ca and writing, you know, by candlelight and, you know, with eyes that were damaged and, you know, it was really, they worked really, really hard. And, and Olmsted Senior was working outside and inside and being a manager and doing a lot of different things. Um, and so, you know, it's a wonder it was, you know, it was exhausting. Um, and he create, created a high bar for yeah. his um, sons to follow. And, you know, they worked very, very, very hard. With regard to mental illness, <laughs> my thought there is that, you know, many of us have aging parents and we know what it's like. And, you know, he did spend, uh, Olmsted Senior did spend his final years um, at uh, McLean here in Belmont, Massachusetts, where I live. And, um, but you know, it's hard to know if that was something that was more like senile, you know, dementia, or was it just that he was, you know, aging and needed, you know, needed more care than was, you know, able to be provided at home. So um, my thought about this all is, you know, a family that worked incredibly hard and sort of sacrificed personal health for the sake of, you know, the greater good. <laughs> okay, Alan, I'll, I think you have I'll another question. question on. Um, yeah, Olmsted, I think did, and again, I'm not going to do a diagnosis. I'm not a, I'm not a psychiatrist or a psychologist, but <laughs> I think part of it was he felt such a personal connection to all his work. And when things didn't go the right way, I think it really bore down on him. I mean, he, at a point, lost his eyesight, what they used to call hysterical blindness, because of the stress he was under. Uh, he described changing his design for Central Park uh, as what he described as would be breaking his churchly vows. So I think that, I think it was, a, like Lauren was saying, that's what usually will cause depression. It's just, a, it's not just the mental, it's a physical stress. And I, again, uh, I think that was just through the obligation he felt. He, this was a very personal profession for him. Yeah. It wasn't just a job. Just incredible devotion. Yeah. And then, um, Alan, I think you have a couple more questions on your list, and I've got a couple more yep. um, start to wrap up. Okay, I, I want to see if somebody does have the answer to this next one. <laughs> are, are more redwood trees being planted to restore the uh, depleted redwood forest? If so, how many per year and under which administrative auspices? Well, I, I certainly don't know the, 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 the details of the question, like how many, but I think... Uh, both California State Parks and National Park Service are, you know, I think the thing that's really important to remember is by the time um, the conservation movement for coast redwoods on the north coast of California actually gained political steam, 97% of the redwoods had already been cut. So what, what we have left now are these little pockets of old growth trees uh and so and there's so and the watersheds have been so irreparably damaged by logging in between each of these old growth trees that there is certainly an active i mean i would say um 
Save the Redwoods League, which was engaged in the very, very early preservation of the Redwoods. If you go to their website, I'm sure you can find the detail you're looking for. Um, or Semper Virens, which was uh, what's, what, what set aside Big Basin, which just this past week burned. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, it's, it, 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 and the structures. Yeah. So anyway, there's a lot of misinformation out there right now, exactly what's going on in Big Basin. And nobody's really done a survey yet, but they have lost some historic structures. And I'm sure there was, was some damage question. to the trees. That was the next question, actually, though, about the uh, structures in Big Basin. So thanks yeah. for that. So those are the three questions I have. I don't know if you have any more, Brianne, on your end. I oh, I see right here. Hold on. Let me see. I think I, I see. I do. Um, so this question goes more towards Sally and the production side about um, how do you go about developing this type of film? Do you start with a script with specific ge geographic sites that you know you want to include with a historical perspective? And then how does this project evolve? Well, I'm going to share this answer with my husband, David, because we're husband and wife, producer and director, and work extremely collaboratively. But David starts with the script. Um, the script grows out of the two of us as a couple scouting. Um, and then we add to the script. But I'm going to let you speak to some of that, too, because then I grow, I become the editor once it's done. Yeah, I, I would say, you know, there are two kinds of films. Uh, one is, you know, a, a passion project that comes from the heart. Um, that we birth. That we birth and go out and raise the money for, or at least try to raise the money for. Um, the California Forever film was basically dropped into our lap uh, by a group of uh, retired California State Park, um, you know, uh, uh, administrators who really wanted to, who really, you know, this was just, if you recall, the film came out right at the moment that they were closing parks because of a lack of funding. I don't know if you remember that, but these, these park, these passionate park advocates saw that coming and they wanted to, um, they wanted us to make a film that would make the case for the importance of California State Parks. So they came to us with the idea and then Sally and I did the initial research, developed the script. Then we go out and we scout as many, you know, we scouted more than a hundred state parks. We ended up shooting in 45. So. And then, you know, as a writer myself, David typically writes the first draft script and I edit it. And both of us separately and together are very in touch with this team of advisors who were the people that brought the film to us. Um, we say where we're stuck. We tell them that we're interested in this area. We, can you gear us toward more research? It's a very collaborative uh, process. But um, once, of course, we have the script approved, once we have to set up the shoot to go, um, a lot of the logistics are left up to me to be in touch with the various heads of parks to make sure it's okay with them. It made it a lot easier that California State Parks was the group that hired us because we had their letter of approval of us as the filmmakers. So they typically said yes to us. Yeah, and I think the, the other piece of it is that in, as in any documentary, um, the, the content of the interviews, which are done first, um, will, will really shape what it is that we're filming because out of the interviews come the, really the arc of the story, the intellectual arc of the story, the emotional arc of the story comes from the place. That's important because a lot of you are very literate with television and documentaries and you see a lot of stuff and the question always come up, how much was scripted and how much was, was done on the, on the, in the moment. And I just have to say that um, we don't make our films in the editing room. <laughs> we set out with some goals and then we have a brilliant editor who brings more to it but there are plenty of people who just film endlessly and then the film is really made in the editing room that's not the way we make our yeah, films. Our, our, our films are really really script driven um the the, story, the shooting story driven. the shooting script for california forever was about 75 pages for one episode and you know we, we've and included in that script are you know story points that we want each interview to hit so mm -hmm. that we know before we even sit down obviously 
it leaves room for improvisation. If somebody drops an extraordinary comment or tells a story that we had never heard of, then that certainly- We take it in that direction. Yeah, but it's not, it's not improvisational at and, all. And I realize more in episode two, probably of California Forever than the film you've seen, which was episode one, David um, helped me see that if I was gonna find people to participate, it had to be people that we would not tell exactly what we were doing so that their reaction to the place was mm. in the moment, was emotive, and was real. Mm. Does uh, that answer I'm the looking question? at the... Yes. Oh, I'm just going to say, I'm looking at the time. I don't know what... Yep. Just one more question, just to wrap up with everybody, and everybody is welcome to answer this question. Um, I know that there is a lot of conversation and a lot of um, time spent in the film thinking through the senior to junior um, legacy and how much... Junior was inspired by the work that his father had done, Lauren, like you said, waving around the, uh, the report. The report. <laughs> um, so just to all of you thinking through, here we are sitting on our computers in 2020, and I know that parks are getting overused right now or used much more because of the restrictions on every other type of space. Um, but if you were to think about the legacy as it continues today in 2020, from senior to junior to today, um, what would be your final words on that, whether it be in California or throughout the nation, Yosemite, um, all of those places that they touched? What would you what would you want to say about the legacy today as we sit on our computers very far away from each other? Anyone is welcome to start. Uh, well, I would I would I would say that um, what the pandemic has taught us is the importance importance of um, access to the outdoors Absolutely. and in a time where um, you know there's a health crisis um, Olmsted senior was keenly aware of the health of the American cities during an, an, the industrial period and the um, issues with sanitation it was huge for him um, uh, giving um, the immigrant population in dense urban areas access to parks so they had they could experience the restorative value of natural scenery even in a city was so important access to fresh milk so that to battle infant cholera that was such a problem in uh, 19th century cities a lot of these issues exist today in a 21st century context slightly differently but we need parks now more than ever in my mind and i feel that we should be doing much more in particularly in dense urban areas to provide access Absolutely. than we are doing today and i think there have been studies out that show that you know parks are more crowded in um in um uh communities with few fewer advantages and and that's a problem i think we ought to be doing more to provide uh, more parks so i uh, from my view the legacy is um and the goals that both that the that federal government senior and the successor firms carried through with regard to parks and open space um, remains um, absolutely relevant today. Mm -hmm. I wanted to second um, that. Okay. I wanted to second ahead, what you were saying, Lauren, and also that I think the idea of what the Olmsteads was saying is very real to people right now. Because if you're living in a teeny little condo in San Francisco and you can't get outside, you want to be able to leave and go the two and a half hours east to where David and I live and experience the outdoors really, really badly. Mm. And if these places didn't exist, people would not. I think it's. I think their legacy is more real now than it ever has been. Mm. Yeah. I. Uh, it, it's not a short answer, but so I have to drop one of the ideas that I wanted to present. <laughs> so I'll just I'll just give you this one, and um, I do a program about John Muir, and uh, and what I what I tell the audience is is that. You have to remember that when Olmsted and Muir were in Yosemite, Manifest Destiny was a religion. It was mm -hmm. a national goal. If, the, if you couldn't get lumber from the tree, 
if you couldn't get gold out of the ground, if you couldn't put down a farm and grow corn and raise cattle, the land was useless. And these gentlemen stood up and they said, hey, wait a minute. Wait a minute, it's not useless. You know, there's, 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 there's something going on in the West that doesn't really occur in a lot of other places on the planet. And they, you know, the fact that they had the vision to preserve these places for future generations is, it's incredible given the national consciousness at, at the moment. It would be literally like being in a room with a hundred people who were saying one word, yes, yes, yes. And one person stood up in that room of a hundred people and said, no. So mm. it's, out now, all over the place. I mean, it's, it's not only clairvoyant in their vision, but it's also incredibly brave. It took a lot of courage. And I'll, I'll just like to add in that I think one of the greatest legacy is not only do we expect to have green space to go to, we demand it now. Um, and uh, I always, one of my favorite quotes uh, about these spaces and um, is I use a quote from Robert Frost who said that home is the place where when you have to go there, they have to take you in. And that's <laughs> what a park is. Yeah. Um, and I also think another legacy a little bit more specific is one of the projects that Frederick Lawrence said Jr. was involved with, it was an advocate for, was the protection of the Everglades. And that was a huge shift because now you weren't protect, protecting something that was like a beautiful thing. You were protecting alligators and swamps. And that, in some ways, really led to the Wilderness Act because now you're saying, okay, now we're going to set aside areas like that. So I think, uh, again, it was the fact that we now expect that we're going to have that park to go to and they're going to have to take us in. Mm. Well said. That's a very nice sentiment to end on. Um, I want to thank all the panelists uh, for participating tonight. It was a really great discussion. Uh, thank you all for attending. Um, if you are not signed up, or um, you can sign up for our email list on our website. So if you're interested in future programming that we're offering, please let us know. You can follow us on social media. Um, we're on Facebook and Instagram at Olmsted NHS. Um, so you can find out a lot more information about how we will be moving forward virtually. Um, and if you're interested more in Fred Jr. and the California projects um, currently at Olmstead um, in Brookline, for those of you who are local, and there are some of you who are not going to be able to get here, um, there is an outdoor exhibit set up um, in our space. So you are able to come and, and explore the landscape as well as check out the exhibits that we have um, out in the landscape as well. So thank you all so much for participating.